time, Mary, till 10.30, is that right? Oh, yeah, sure, 10.30 or 10.35, actually. Okay, great. Can, can everybody hear me? Because I'm told I'm loud by default, so with a speaker on, that gets even worse. Um, so thanks for the intro, Mary. I'm really pleased to be here. When, when I spoke with Mary, um, I've done a number of these outreach activities. Typically, I, I actually talk with the kids, so this is a bit of a new forum for me. So if you don't like me, hold your coffee. Um, but you can beat me up later. I, I think what I've done though is I've taken a little bit of a different spin. I'm, I'm happy to talk to any of the girls at any time uh, on the choice of engineering as a career. You know, as Mary referenced, it is still a bit untraditional uh, for women. We're going to go through some numbers and then I'm going to talk to, to you guys as the parents, as the, the key influencers and, and different people in these girls' lives who will actually help them take these types of uh, initiatives going forward. Just in the way of understanding kind of the crowd, how many people in here actually have engineering or technology backgrounds? Just roughly. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot more than I anticipate. Okay, so that's great. So let's look at some of the numbers. Um, and, and, and if there's engineers in the crowd, I can provide reference details later. I didn't put it in the, uh, in the presentation, but I know that's important sometimes. So if we look at some of the numbers, the numbers today are still quite staggering in engineering as a profession. Across Canada, there's still less than 20% of the undergraduate population that is female. Mary, you said at Waterloo it's, it's about this number as well, about, roughly? Yeah, so yeah, we're, right now we're about 18% of Waterloo. Yeah, so this is a national statistic across Canada. In the province, in the licensure with the Professional Engineers of Ontario Association, there's still only less than 7%. So of the 20% across Canada that do graduate, I don't have the national statistics, but I'm going to guess the average is about the same. There's still less than half that actually pursue professional licensure. And in female positions, or engineering positions in technology sector, the actual share that's held by females today is still a staggering less than 10%. So I mean, as an industry as a whole, there's a great amount of opportunity for females in the profession. Compound that with the fact that the demographic shift that's happening right now shows us that between 2010 and 2013, there's going to be 70,000 less total high school graduates. And by 2016, that's actually a compound number of 130,000 less graduates. So if you look at the labor market for engineering as a technology, as a profession, you're going to see a massive, massive shortage of supply. One of the ways to bridge this gap is to encourage more females into the profession. That's going to help because when you see the total population shrink and when that total population only has this many females that go into it to begin with, that's a really compounded effect. And it's a big, big, big concern for people like me who have to employ people every day and who have to employ highly talented and people who are passionate about what they do. It's a big concern. Between 1997 and 2008, so over the last decade, the data shows that as a sector, technology has grown by 45%. Employability in this sector and the number of jobs that have been created nationally has risen by 45%. Compare that to the cumulative total of all other industries at roughly 24%. So you're seeing almost the double, well, in this case, almost double, almost double the rate of growth. So what am I trying to tell you? High, high, high market potential for employability. High demand for the people of the skill sets that are coming out of these programs. An impending shortage of those people. So for, for people who are coming out of the programs right now, this, this area of, you know, will I be able to get a job? Will I be able to have a career? The answer is yes. My last slide. So I'm pretty passionate about keeping engineering and keeping high technology within Canada. It's not to say that globally there are not opportunities that, that should and can be pursued. It's just as a, as a nation, you know, I think it behooves the, the technical leaders and, and the academic leaders of Canada to make sure that we're training and we're retaining that talent within Canada so that we continue to be a nation that produces, uh, I guess, solutions to world problems. And I think that we're still poised to do that. So why are the numbers the numbers? Because those are some pretty, pretty horrific numbers, from my opinion. Perceptions, barriers, beliefs, and fears. I would, I would hazard a guess that everybody in here fits into one of these categories, as do your daughters. There's perceptions, beliefs, and fears that are within all of us, right? What I want to do is talk a little about, about what those are. Some of them are up there in the bubbles, the old boys club, the gender stereotypes. Um, I hear a lot when I talk with the girls. I do, uh, I do volunteer work for junior achievements in Waterloo, and I get out and I teach grade fours and fives and seven and eights and nines and tens. And when I talk to those girls, when they say, oh, you're an engineer, you know, tell me what you do, and I talk to them, they tell me they don't feel like they belong. 
I hear that over and over and over again. And when I try to get to an understanding of why that is, they can't tell me. Here's what the studies show. The studies show that in a large majority of women, young women this is, they do not have a good understanding of what engineering is. Everybody knows the word. The, de the definition in the dictionary, not all that helpful, right? I mean, it says you solve problems. Defin <laughs> definition in Wikipedia, same. Definition when you Google it, same, right? But what is it, right? These girls need to know what it is, and that's what these events are for. The second thing is that, and, and somebody touched on this already, a lot of girls don't see the interconnectedness between engineering and helping people or engineering and helping the world, right? You naturally see that in medicine and in health sciences. Or if you look at the programming, the content programming, the television, the, the video streaming that the kids are watching, when's the last time you saw an engineering show? You didn't, right? <laughs> you saw a lot of law, you saw a lot of medicine. Um, there was a brilliant show and it actually got canceled this year and here's my geekness coming out. It was called Numbers. It was all about mathematics used to solve FBI problems. Great show. Not entirely sure the mathematics was mostly right. Probably get some opinion on uh, some of the professors here. But that was the first show that I actually saw where they were promoting mathematics for solving problems, right? And if you extrapolate that into engineering solving world problems, it would have been a great platform. They canceled the show, right? <laughs> And what you don't see, you know, when you're watching things that, I don't know what they watch. I mean, I watch, you know, things like Grey's Anatomy. I watched it last night off the PVR. And there's an example, right? There's my PVR. That's a mechatronics little system, right? And, and then you watch shows like Grey's Anatomy. And we had a great plug for Christy. There was a technology that we have, I'll show a picture later, which takes digital light and it projects, uh, projects it onto your skin. And it shows the venous structure um, within, uh, within your skin. And it was on one of the medical shows. It was a great plug for the technology, but the shows don't emphasize that, right? So if you look at the content programming, the girls aren't really seeing what engineering is. And that's something we can change. This is the perception they have. These are their words. This is a, sum, you know, a summary of their words, right? They're, they're cubicle jobs, they're construction hat jobs. And there's a picture later on in this presentation that doesn't help that perception, which is of me in, in my frosh week. Um, but they don't understand that it's a people-focused industry, that it's a people-focused profession. It really is. And then the last thing that we hear recurringly is there's no role models, right? So, I mean, I, I, I'm very pleased to see the crowd of parents, right? Because you're their first line of role model. And if you're not informed or you don't know where to get information or you don't know how to get them resources, then that hinders them being able to understand the profession, being able to make some of those informed choices. So I'm going to talk about some strategies that I think we as a community and you as parents can do to help your girls understand the profession more. Okay. This is probably one of the most disturbing statistics. Uh, and again, I can give you the psychology reference information if anybody's interested. The, study, the, psych, the psychology studies show that the onset of low self-esteem um, and, and poor self-confidence, I guess kind of combined, start as early as at a uh, grade three. So the girls at grade three are, let me think, nine, six, seven, eight, eight, does that sound about right? Eight or nine, eight or, eight or nine? Yeah, I, I have six year olds, so they're not, they're not quite there yet. So I got two years before I have to deal with this. Um, this is, pardon me? It's tough the grade three, grade four years tough on girls. Yeah, and what's interesting is, it, the reason the statistic comes out um, is because the, the, the standardized testing, right, starts in grade three. And the stats show that the standardized tests, bar none, the girls outperform the boys. And there's lots of reasons for that. And this is not meant to be a male bashing session by any stretch. But um, the girls do develop intellectually at a faster pace. That's also a known statistic. But what happens here and what the combined studies show is that despite the girls are outperforming their males, uh, counterparts in the, in the standardized tests, they don't believe it. That's the study. You can show them the raw numbers, and yet they don't, in their minds, believe that. Nobody knows where this low self-esteem and, and the lack of self-confidence comes from, but they don't believe it. They don't believe that they do it. And then what you get is you get grade 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then they go to high school, 9, 10, and 11, where they have to start making those decisions about keeping math and science, and they don't believe that they're good at those subjects. doesn't matter what the numbers are, but they psychologically don't believe it. And for that, we can make changes we can help them know that that's not the case and that we can change that perception that they have. Okay. So why your daughters are good for engineering? Because I was bored and I like graphics. I thought I would do this and make you guess why you thought they were good. Anybody? Anybody? 
Okay. So by <laughs> you can match the objects to the words. Um, they're analytical. By default, they're natural problem solvers. Right? These, are, uh, these are very intrinsic core values that your girls have. They're objective. They bring compassion to what they do and who they talk to and who they interact with. Anybody else? You guys are like really giving me a rough time at 10 o'clock. Um, they provide balance in decision making and in critical analysis. They're creative and they're innovative. They solve problems different than other people do. Right? They particularly solve problems different than their male counterparts do. And they're intuitive global thinkers, right? which is why this connection of they don't see how what engineering does can help change the world is difficult for them because they want to do that because by default they're global thinkers. Right? Last set of objects. Come on, this, and no, I'm not frying their brains. They understand naturally interconnectedness. And what that means, I read this last night and uh, <laughs> I was showing somebody at home and they said, what is interconnectedness? Like, what, what is that, an engineering word? <laughs> How is that an engineering word? Um, so what I mean by the interconnectedness is they actually have the ability to draw from a, a very broad range of abstract ideas and narrow it into very concrete relationships, that type of interconnectedness. That's a skill set that's absolutely paramount in being, an, you know, being a good engineer. Uh, and, the, and the girls do this by default. And the last point, um, although I make light of the fact their brains are wired differently, um, this is in fact true. The psychology studies show that the amount of neurons that fire between the left and the right hand brain of females is substantially greater than that of males. And again, I'm not male bashing, there's a lot of dads here. Um, but by default, they get a different way of thinking. It just happens naturally to them. It's a skill set they bring. Okay. So why is the profession good for your daughters? I mean, we talked about you know, those, those, those raw talents that your girls have that make them great for engineering. But why is engineering as a profession good for them? I think there's a lot of reasons. The choices are plentiful. We heard that twice this morning. It doesn't really matter which discipline they go into. There's lots of places that they can go from once they've done that. Um, that's what I mean by the choices are plentiful. There's the continued growth in the industry, as I talked earlier about the, the raw numbers of the industry, and there's a shortage of talent. So again, their employability is quite high. Uh, there's an, this notion of engineering as a platform degree. Um, <laughs> believe me, it's a tough platform degree to attain. Um, it's not without hard effort, but it is a platform, and I know that, that Jennifer's gonna speak later about how you can take an engineering degree and do different things with it. And I think that's important because, you know what, it's tough. It's tough to make a career decision when you're in grade 7, 8, 9, or 10, even 11, 12, 13, right? I know a lot of kids after the, um, the, the abolishment of grade 13 that go back because they're not entirely sure still what they want to do. It's hard to make choices. It's hard to make choices that are perceived to be lifelong when you're that young. Engineering is a foundation degree. You choose it once, you learn it, and then you grow from there. It's a phenomenal discipline for that. And then the last part is, you know, the tangible social benefits, the social, the people, um, the, the, human, the humanitarian aspect to it. Right? I think that when you, start, when you start talking about engineering in these terms, the girls start to get a different relatedness to it. So what do I think your girls should be doing now? Uh, I'm going to talk about what I think they should do and what I think uh, you as parents should be doing and what we as a community need to do. They have to keep taking math and science. Right? This is the thing. Again, national statistics show these subjects get dropped fairly early on by girls for all the reasons I've discussed so far. That hurts. It's hard to go back and take math and science once you're already that far past high school, right? So if you get to the end of high school and you decide you actually want to try engineering, they want to try engineering, it's hard to go back. Hard in terms of time. It takes time and then it puts them out of their cohort range, puts them out of the range with their, co you know, with their, with their friends and it drops them out that way. So it's hard for them to want to go back. Uh, they need to become better informed. We need to do a better job at, at helping them understand what engineering is, and events like this are great for that. Um, I think that they need to spend time, especially as they get older. The 7s, 8s, they're just starting to get there. The 9s, 10s, and 11s, they're there. Right? They need to start using all these resources that they have readily available now. I mean, everything from Facebook to Twitter to their iPods to their iTouches. To, I mean, the, the rate at which information can flow today is, is absolutely stunning. Um, the rate at which it's changed in 10 years, addressing the, the young girl's question earlier on in the days, there's still things to invent. I mean, it's amazing to me. There are a ton of resources that they have that I never had 15 years ago that I'm sure half of us never had uh, within the last decade. 
encouraging them to actually take hold of that resource pool that they have and start learning. That's something we can do and they should be doing it too. They should be encouraged to do that. They have to find things that fit their passions. A lot of people, and this is something that came early to me in, in, in my education was, you know, what was I excited about? Right? Because that's what I should have, that's, that's, I had a teacher, I had a grade 10 math teacher. I was going to be a pharmacist. That was my job. That's what I was doing. Why? Because I lived in a small town and I liked the pharmacist. Right? Um, I mean, that was it. That, that was really, his name was Mark at IDA Pharmacy. Right? There were like 12,000 people where I grew up. It wasn't that big. Um, and this guy was great. And he, and he taught me and he showed me what he did and he let me into the pharmacy and he just kind of helped, you know, and I could interact with the people. It was great. That's what I wanted to be, right? I got into grade 10 and, uh, and I love mathematics. I love math my whole life. I got into grade 10. It was time to start, you know, thinking about what was I going to do. And so I was talking to the math teacher, and I said, yep, I'm going to go into pharmacy. And he looked at me, and he said, what? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, what's wrong with that? He said, what are you, nuts? You're going to be bored. I'm like, mm, Mark doesn't say that, right? And he said, no, no, no. He said, hold on, hold on, Jen. What do you like? I said, well, I like people. What else do you like? What else do you like? He's my math teacher, right? He knows the answer. I said, I like math. He said, OK, so how about we look at engineering? I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, what's engineering? Right? Same question your girls are getting, you know, that, that you guys are trying to answer right now. And he came, back, he came back and he didn't have all the answers either. But what he started to do is he started to show me what engineering looks like. And the big sell for him, being the math teacher, of course, was it doesn't matter if you like engineering, because let me tell you, I hate physics. Scary when I'm a mechanical aerospace engineer, but I hate physics. But I love mathematics. So I chose engineering because I liked math. And I had one pivotal guy in my life that changed my direction forever. And that was my grade 10 math teacher. And without him, I probably would be a pharmacist bored to death, right? No disrespect to the pharmacy um, folks. But those mentors are important, right? These, these are the people that we have to help our girls find if we don't already know them. So coming back to, you know, that's what the girls can do. What can we do as, as parents? We can keep uh, being interested by the fact that you're here. That tells me you're interested. And, and that's brilliant, because I think there are a lot of kids today that are underserved in that regard. And so I think that keeping them talking, showing that you're interested, showing that they have choice, helping them understand uh, what those choices are, and making sure that they don't make those decisions to drop math and science early on in their academic careers is, uh, is a very, very pivotal point and, and aspect of what you can do. Um, again, I talked about helping them understand their choices more, being a resource for them. Encourage them to join teams, volunteer, get a part-time job if they don't already. Some of them are maybe a bit too young. But when we look at engineering disciplines and then we look at engineering curriculum programs in terms of post-secondary education, and, and you know, I've talked with Mary about this too, there's the depth of focus, right? That's the technical training, all the core foundation aspects of engineering, but then there's this breadth piece, and the breadth piece is important. Is that me? I got like two microphones. No, I turned that off. I turned the Blackberry off. OK, now I'm off. Okay. I'm off, yeah? I can still hear you. you can hear me, though? <laughs> Video guy says we're good. Um, see, I told you I was loud. Um, the, uh, the, the breadth of engineering in terms of it's not just about discipline, depth, and focus. I mean, there is that. There is a foundational skill set, of course. And that's what you train for. That's the training. But what we can do as parents right now is we can encourage the girls to, to get the breadth of engineering. And this is the part that gets them to understand it is people-focused. It is team-based. It is problem solving, it is fun, and it is about colleagues, and it is about friends, right? And doing things like team sports and holding a part-time job and volunteering, that helps them understand, so, you know, understand those things now. And the last thing that I put up on this board, because I think this is important, because I went through this when I was, with, uh, when I was in grade 10 and 11 as well. I had great parents. You know, I, I was the first kid in my family that actually went to university, and so they were just happy to take a boo. I was on my way. They didn't have that opportunity. And I remember my mom saying the hardest thing for them when I was starting to make those choices was to not communicate the fears that they had. They were scared. They'd never been there. But then they were scared too because it was so male dominated. And here's their itty bitty little girl, right? I get it. I got one. I got a six year old. I have one of each. I have twins. They're kind of fun. But, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. And we have to try hard as parents not to relay the fears that we might have to them and not to project our fears onto them. So hide in your shell if you're feeling like that. And, uh, and talk to somebody else because they need your support.
Okay. What do we as a community do? We being, um, you know, myself, the people that work in industry, the community uh, folks that deal with outreach, the stuff that we're doing. We need to be advocates. We need to be out in the in the system at the primary and the secondary education levels. We need to share our passion and our experiences because I think that telling stories and giving the human side to it is actually what's going to make the difference in a lot of these girls' uh, decision making. We need to, th this is one that's, <laughs> that's passionate of mine, I'm sure my president will be happy when I stand in a public forum and say it, but I think private industry needs to look at ways to help fund um, entrance scholarships and financial services. And again, this is a big concern across, genera uh, across gender. This isn't just about women, but if there's a way to remove some of the barriers, and if some of those barriers are these girls aren't too sure how they're going to afford it, then I think private sector needs to look at creating special and unique uh, entrance type campaigns that, that help bring in higher percentages of females into the industry. I think we need to create environments where they feel at parity and they feel safe. I do this at, at work at Christy. Um, I'm responsible for a group of about 140 engineers and every term I employ 20 University of, generally University of Waterloo, I do have some other co-op program students, um, usually 20 per, per term. So it's 60 students per year and it's a very, very, very big um, passion of mine to make sure that we have these opportunities. I forego full-time headcount so that I can keep a million dollars in reserve to support co-op programs because I really believe that giving these people, be it male or female, female in the context of today, an opportunity to come in and understand what engineering is and to try it and to feel safe in an environment that shows them what it's like is important. And I think as a community we need to keep doing that. And the last point is to mentor selfishly, right? We have to do this because no one else is going to because if we don't, we're not going to bridge this gap. That number will stay at 10% for the next decade or two, and we can't afford to have that. Not, not as parents, not as industry leaders, and not as a nation. That's what I believe. Okay. So my journey, I mean, Mary introduced me. That's me. I don't show these pictures to many. Um, <laughs> see the hard hat? Told you. It's just not good. Um, and there's another one coming. Uh, my dad owned a construction business. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what the hat is. But this is my journey, you know, it was, I was little, really little, doing everyday things except maybe climbing the ladder. Again, my dad owned a construction business at the time. Um, and then I moved on. Uh, top left picture is my high school graduation. Uh, I graduated from a small high school uh, outside St. Catharines, Ontario. Then I went to McGill University and I just had the time of my life, absolute time of my life. Um, the girl down here, this is one of my crazy best friends from university. Uh, also graduated in international business and uh, yeah she was celebrating homecoming sorry about the beer it's an inevitability it will happen um, but uh, you know that, that was university this guy here this is um, this is dr. Dave Williams uh, and again I study mechanical and aerospace engineering so I have a split degree and uh, and I was gonna go to NASA and then I had kids and uh, and that didn't happen so I had to stick around but that was okay and I met Dave uh, a couple times. I met him at an outreach event my last year of university, which is what this picture is, and I've subsequently come full circle and I had him at my office uh, but a month ago at Christie because he's running the Center for Minimally Invasive Surgery at McMaster University and, uh, and we actually have a technology that he's quite interested in for visualization at Christie. So it's just, again, you can see the breadth and, and, and how everything kind of comes full circle. Okay. Graduation, so we went uh, far right picture, this is me graduating from McGill. This guy here, this is a family friend of ours. He's the only other guy I ever knew who was an engineer. So when I graduated from McGill, I asked him would he please come and participate in the ceremony where engineers get their iron rings that we all wear so proudly, or most of us wear very proudly. Um, you know, it was, I, and there was this guy, right? I mean, he was a family friend. He was friends with my parents. I'd see him maybe once every three years. And he was ecstatic to come up and do this because he was there to share it. Uh, and I, you know, I love to do the same. And then this is a crowd of folks that I graduated with that I still have contact today. All of us happily, gainfully employed <laughs> uh, in the discipline. And this is what I do now. So, you know, I work for Gracie Digital Systems, which is an organization just down the road. Um, we do, we build the most advanced uh, projectors and visualization systems in the world. Everything from uh, all the visual stuff that you saw at the Beijing Summer Olympics to the, the Vancouver Olympics. If it, you know, if it looked like light, it probably was a piece of technology that's developed just down the road to the piece on the right at the top that I talked about, the, the venous access. So that technology now is being used to improve 
pediatric care where if you've got to take your children and they need to have a um, you know an IV put in instead of the the nurse who's doing her best to get that IV in and sticks your kid three four five six seven eight times uh, you can do it once yeah. um, and, and this is what we do right so I mean I'm a mechanical engineer trained in mechanical and aerospace engineering I started my career in the aerospace industry I actually worked at Comdev another local company um, I left that I joined Christie because I thought the technology was excellent uh, I joined, uh, I, was a, I was an engineer at Comdev, I, I advanced to advanced engineer, I moved up the ladder there a little bit, I went to Christie, um, I stayed in engineering within their technical group, then I started doing project management because again I love the people, uh, and then I progressed from, from project manager to engineering director to vice president, and, uh, and I, it's just, it's <laughs> people say, you know, what did you learn when you went to engineering school? I learned how to think in a certain way that allows me to solve a lot of problems in a lot of different ways in a lot of different areas. And I think if that's the type of message you take home from, from me today, then, then I'll have done my job. So, thank you.